Welcome to Inside Pride, a series of video conversations produced by San Francisco Pride, aimed at giving the Bay Area's LGBTQ communities greater insight into who we are and what we do. I'm Peter Astrid Kane, SF Pride's communications manager, and I use they, them pronouns. On Friday and Saturday, October 8th and 9th, we're set to have our third annual SF Pride golf tournament and fundraiser, a pro-am scramble at the world-renowned TPC Harding Park here in San Francisco, in which some 150 golfers compete to raise funds to help us fulfill our mission to educate the world, commemorate our heritage, celebrate our culture, and liberate our people. It's a major event for SF Pride, and having done a site visit to the course only yesterday with my colleague, Rachel, SF Pride's Director of Partnerships and Giving, I can say it's going to be hella queer out there. In addition to all the players and probably a lot of Rainbow Argyle, we're excited to welcome two out professional golfers, Haley Davidson and Tad Fujikawa. Haley is a 28-year-old Scottish-born Floridian who, earlier this year, became the first openly trans woman to win a PGA tournament. Tad, a native of Honolulu, became the youngest player ever to qualify for the US Open, doing so in 2006 at age 15. In September 2018, he also became the first male professional golfer to come out as gay. Haley is our first guest today, and I'm very grateful to welcome her to Inside Pride. Hi, Haley. How you doing? Good. How are you? Fantastic. Thank you. So give us a little bit of insight into your victory earlier this year out on the course. Yeah, so I'm trying to think. It was back in May. Um, I had actually, so long story short, I actually just had gender reassignment surgery back in January. So to be honest, the first like five months I was I didn't expect a ton for myself at the start, mainly because of, you know, the whole pain factor. I wasn't sure, um, you know, how things would be. So I was kind of testing the waters. I mean, to be honest, I had to sit on one of those, one of those like hernia pillows the whole time during that tournament, just because of the pain. And that was, I was a fun conversation describing that to everyone. Um, but yeah, no, it was kind of, kind of eye opening. Um, even though it was a small tournament, it was eye-opening to know that with six years off, uh, you know, I could do it again. And it's not just some stupid publicity thing um, that I know a lot of people thought it was at first. So it was nice to kind of get that reassurance that, you know, th this is kind of the right path for me. Um, again, I, in my opinion, I needed a second win to kind of verify it for a lot of people. Um, which I did luckily, but no, it was, it was nice and eye-opening and, and kind of gave me hope, um, as to what I'm doing and, you know, I'm not just messing about for a year kind of thing. So it was really nice. Yeah. That's interesting that you said you needed a second win. Um, can you, can you give us a little more about that? I think, did you face a lot of doubters and skeptics or people who thought you were just some like phenom who might fade away? Um, so my worry was, and I suppose this can happen in, in any sport, you can kind of get like, or anything entertainment wise, even, even going in music, you can kind of get like a one hit wonder. Um, and I didn't want that to kind of be my, my one moment and then nothing ever good happen again. And everyone's like, oh, okay, that's over with. Don't need to deal with it anymore. Um, so as great as the first one was, the second one almost meant more. I mean, I was more nervous during the first one. Um, but the second one almost meant more just to be like, hey, it wasn't a fluke. I did it again, you know. Um, so it kind of, it, one, yes, it helped me, but I think it helped every, any, you know, kind of inlookers. Um, it, it really helped on that behalf to kind of be like, hey, this isn't just some random lucky thing that happened, um, that it, it could be hopefully a more regular thing, um, you know, the more time I get to put in. So we'll, we'll see. Are there other trans golfers now? Uh, I have not heard of, uh, no, I have not heard of any at all. Other than um, Dr. Lancaster, who I've been lucky to be pretty close with. Um, I mean, she's not playing anymore. So, I mean, other than me, I, I don't know of any other active players. I know there's Jamie O'Neill who's doing like long drive, but mm -hmm. in the actual like playing side, I know I, I've not had anyone reach out to me or anything like that. So I'm, 
I kind of kind of feel like I'm alone, not in a bad way all the time, but yeah, I kind of feel like I'm alone in that sense that I am. I feel like I'm the only one, which, you know, not everyone's open, so I can understand that too. Right. You know, who knows? Maybe there is. Hopefully there is, you know, that would be nice. Basically, <laughs> sooner or later, there's bound to be someone. I, I hope it's sooner rather than later. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, the game of golf historically has been not merely dominated by cis men, but also just very gendered. You know, I, I'm not all that well versed in the mechanics and the finer points of golf, but just from being on the course yesterday, you know, and seeing the quote unquote ladies tee and things like that, like you're reminded of just how much gender is baked into the sport itself. Um, do you see things changing in real time? Or I'm, obviously there's progress yet to be made, but are there things that give you hope or make you feel encouraged for the future? Um, yes and no. Um, so I actually, I, I work, some I still work um, for the Golf Channel. And when I first started working there, I was doing, you know, taking a lot of phone calls. So I would hear a lot on that behalf. And just like you were saying, you know, when you're describing a golf course to someone, that's still the terminology a lot of people used when describing. It wasn't, you know, you always get, what is it, the blue tees or the red tees. Those are like people's generic colors. Or then they go the men's tees or the women's tees. There's no kind of in between, which obviously in golf, that shouldn't be the case because a lot of people shouldn't be playing from those tees in the first place. Um, but yeah, no, it's, there is, it is generational, I believe, um, and not in a bad way. I think golf is still so old and conservative that right now there's still enough of that older generation kind of really trying to hold on to those kind of not overly dumb, but in a way dumb sayings like men's tees, you know, really doing that gender split with things, which yes, in some ways is under, you know, well, not really understandable, but you know, like say men's tournaments or women's tournaments. Yeah, that's great. It makes sense. But yeah, no, a lot of things are just like, that doesn't even, you know, like I, I put it this way, even a guy I play with down here, he was terrified to move up a tee box just because of words like that. Not because of anything else. I'm like, Hey, it's literally just me and you, like no one else has seen anything. We're just out here. Like you're a day off work, go have fun. And it was still like a mental thing. He couldn't get himself to do it just because, well, where I grew up, it was, these were the ladies tees. And it's like, no, you just, you need to be where you're going to have fun. So I'm actively trying to help with that, that push. Um, I see, a lot more in the kind of this generation here. Um, and it's, I wouldn't say it's overly pushing the older generation out, but at the same time, there are a few who are, are open-minded to it. So yes and no. Well, I, I think it, that would be a, hopefully a great thing to, to discuss in five years, hopefully. Hopefully that will be a great new kind of opening as to where things are going. I, I hope so, yeah. Considering that you're a professional trans athlete, and especially this year, trans athletes, oftentimes, you know, children or young people have made the news a lot because there's been a kind of moral panic around the specter of athletes who are assigned male at birth competing in women's sports. And during the tail end of the Olympics, you tweeted something that I thought was very interesting. And it's a point that isn't always brought up in this discussion which is that you said that he, uh, HRT, hormone replacement therapy, had cost you a little bit of edge on your swing and that you had lost 30 yards on your drives. Um, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you know, when people are panicking that people who are assigned male at birth have an unfair competitive advantage, there had been no trans athletes in the just concluded Olympics who had kind of romped to victory. So when people, do, do you feel that this discussion is not including that point? Yeah, no, I, I feel like, and honestly, this goes back to um, even a comment uh, Caitlyn Jenner said earlier this year, kind of on, on her thoughts on it, you know, I'm sure we all know her opinion was a bit opposite. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people, but at the same time, the way she kind of described it was, you know, yes, if I were to be uh, a cisgender male and one day say, hey, I'm trans and immediately start competing then without anything else, 
yes, there would probably be an, you know, an advantage because th at that point you've done literally nothing. And, you know, in her case, she was using it as, oh, you know, I was a male Olympian. If I would have just swapped over, that would have been, you know, unfair. It's like, well, you should know that's not the case because, you know, I like in my case, I wasn't allowed to compete for six years. And by the time I had gone through everything, you know, yes, there'd been a lot of weight difference and things like that. But, you know, my swing speed was at, and for any golfers listening, my swing speed was at around like 116, 117 before hormones coming out, everything. And I'm right around like 105 right now, which, I mean, you can do the math on some shots. That's as much as, yeah, 30, 40 yards. So, I mean, I, I feel like people just forget about that because they, they just assume it's going to be like, you know, someone comes out and they're allowed to compete immediately, which I don't, you know, it is as much as we want to kind of go that way one day, you know, obviously with in its own restrictions and such, it's not the case. I don't think there's any trans athlete who's really been able to come out and then be allowed to compete pretty much right away. I, even in today's society, I, I don't really think there's always some sort of challenge, whether it's huge or very small, you know, it's never like a, Oh, okay, you're good. You know? So there's always something that's there. So I think people kind of forget that, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the critics just assume like, Oh, you know, like in my case, they assume, you know, there's going to be like a, a tiger woods go out there and pop on a dress and go and play. And it's like, no, that's not how like any of this actually works, you know, one, there's rules within themselves of things. I mean, I had to jump through 15 different hoops of doing everything and anything, you know, for like six years. So, you know, for me, as things kept on going on, I didn't even know if I was going to be able, you know, just because at that point I was six years older. You know, I didn't know if I'd missed my time. So I think there's so much that's lost in that conversation yeah. that you know, obviously the critics just want to like cherry pick their ideas to make it fit their own which uh, as we know is kind of like everything now but um <laughs> yeah no, i do i feel like that it is really lost in there and that's why you know i don't get it as much now and i don't know if that's because of things i have like filtered out on social media so i don't get as much of the hate um but that's something i make sure to do you know and as much as it kind of hurts for me to see you know it's still a mental thing for me seeing the fact that i do hit it like 30 yards shorter it is kind of like a oh well I, you know i used to be able to hit like three clubs shorter this length or, you know, whatever it may be. So it's, you know, it, there's like that mental side of it too, that, you know, there's so much more into it that I think just people kind of forget. So that's, you know, it, as much as it sucks, I don't, I don't mind posting those stats and stuff because like, yeah, it sucks to look at sometimes, but you know, sometimes the hard numbers are what people actually need to see to be like, Oh, that's not actually the case. <laughs> you know, sometimes yeah facts actually help at times <laughs> people take their ignorance of what it means to be trans and then apply that crudely to you know sports and performance metrics and i think that's brave of you to to put that out there to combat that yeah you mentioned a minute ago about the kind of you know the the quiet loneliness of being the only openly trans golfer but i'm wondering if you have any you know shiros or heroes in or outside of golf or athletics or whatever, who kind of inspire you or, you know, people you may have met who've guided you, anything like that? Um, to be honest, it's, and, and I, I, I tell her this all the time, it's Dr. Lancaster has just been the most, I, I'm, in my opinion, I'm so lucky that she had gone through what she did and I was just lucky enough to meet her because I always remind her, you know, you know, and she always kind of jokes, oh, you're younger and things like that. But, you know, I, I personally don't think I would have been able to kind of break those initial barriers that she did. You know, yes, she was at an older age and, you know, and things like that. And people may have thought differently of her because of, you know, say the age difference or whatever it may have been. I, I don't think I would have been able to have those initial conversations or, you know, I don't, I don't know if you've ever spoken to her. She's just She's yeah. so good with words that, you know, just the conversations I'm sure which she had with them. I don't know if I would have been able to be that professional and kind of put things the way she did to 
to get to the point where, you know, yes, it took me six years, but I, I was still able to try because of her. And, you know, I, I'm lucky that she actually came out to Q school. Um, she drove down for uh, two days and she's just, she's meeting her is just, it's meant the world to me and just the things she does. And, you know, I remember when my dad and I had dinner with her, we were down there just learning all the hundreds of things that she does, not only with, you know, yes, golf, and then she does this. And it's like, how do you have time to do anything? So she is just, <laughs> regardless of the golf side, I think just as like a, an activist side too, she's just been the most phenomenal person that I think anyone would just be so grateful to have like 30 minutes with her. You know, she's just the most amazing, amazing person. And I can honestly tell you that anyone who has met her would probably agree with that. That's wonderful. That's great. You have mentioned that you one day wish to compete in the Scottish Open. Um, I'm wondering, I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that there's three reasons for that. One, it's a prestigious tournament. Two, you're Scottish by birth. Three, Scotland is the home of golf. Is there more to it than that? No, and it's, it's interesting. Um, because obviously you get a lot of golfers in the U.S. and they're, you know, their first thing, whether they're male or female, they generally want to win. The U.S. Open is kind of like their, their great tournament they want to win. Yes, some people, depending on the state they live in, they have a different one um, or different ties to a certain tournament. But no, it's, it's mainly for the fact that I was born there. Um, I'm still a citizen of there. It, it's the one tournament that, yes, I don't you know, we, we may not keep in touch and things like that, but like, that's the one term I know I'd be able to, to have the, the few family members that I do have. Um, I, I don't have a large family. <laughs> um, so I, you know, it's the one term I'd actually be able to have probably family members that who, you know, probably aren't going to travel halfway across the world. So it just, I don't know. It, it, it means a lot to me because of that. And yes, the, the British open is great. And, and ideally that would be my one tournament, but you know, the fact that obviously the Scottish Open is played in Scotland every year. Um, I don't know whether, regardless, you know, it's the one term I just want to play in, but yeah, it'd be, that would kind of be the, the mecca of my career, even though it's not a, a, I guess, major or anything. That's, that's kind of like my number one major would be winning the, you know, the, I think, what is it? The Trust Scottish Open, I think is the new sponsor. I don't know, but yeah, no, that, that would be, uh, that would kind of be my mecca and that's, something I'm going to try to see and, you know, hopefully speak to the right people. And, you know, there's sponsors exemptions out there and things. So if anyone's listening, Hey, I, I'll take one of those. Um, so yeah, no, it's, um, I'll, I'll really, I'll, I'll do, you know, that's, that's kind of my goal finding what ways and what paths to, and, and what ways you can earn exemptions into that tournament. And so it's, uh, yeah, that's kind of, it's the one that's on my radar right now, even with, COVID and I'm very COVID wary and not traveling a ton, but it's the one that I'm like, Hey, throw me on a plane. I don't mind going over there. I'll do anything. If put me in that field and I, yep, I'll be there immediately. Excellent. One last question for you in our, you know, prior conversations before we sat down for this interview, uh, it came up that we we're both getting ready to have new tattoos, but you got yours first. You got it yesterday. Um, can you show us and explain what it is? Yes. Yeah, so, well, I've actually gotten, what, oddly enough, I've gotten two in the last, like, two weeks. <laughs> um, funny enough, one I had booked, the one I got yesterday I had booked, and I had to wait, like, four weeks to get. And the other one I was just, like, itching at that point, so I went and got some by someone else. But anyway, um, I unfortunately, I had two, uh, my two kind of lifelong dogs, um, they both passed within two months of each other earlier this summer. Um, one just due to old age. Uh, the other was more, uh, she had bad surgery. But I was, during COVID, I was, and I don't know how people did COVID without pets, first of all. But I, I was bored one day and found one of those like inkless, you know, paw print kits and, and hand kits you would get for babies on Amazon for like four bucks. And I was like, oh, let me try them with the dogs and see if they'll do it. So we got them groomed one day and I actually did it. And when they passed, it's the one thing I was so happy I got. So I went and took it to an artist and he, you know, obviously cleaned up the edges from extra fur and stuff that were around. So thanks. So that's, um, I guess from your angle, the, the one on the right is, was my Cocker Spaniel. Uh, he was 15. He mm -hmm. kind of kept me together when I came out, uh, like the way I like to put it is, 
know, I, I, I don't think I would still be here without him. And then um, his sister Lucy is right next to him. Oh. And then the dog, actually, I got my mom had adopted while I was at preschool. Um, if you're not a Harry Potter fan, those are Luna Lovegood's glasses. Uh -huh. And I named her Luna for Luna Lovegood. So, you know, instead of getting a bunch of paw prints all over me, um, it was kind of a little, you know, play on words there, play on her name. So I've got got my three dogs on me and, you know, as, as much as it sucks at times, you know, I'll always have their, their helping hands with me now. So I'm super excited. And do you have yours yet or no? No, I have to wait another month because the artist that I go to booked up immediately after, you know, California started letting people get tattoos again. Oh, I bet. But the, the last tattoo I had, which is also from her, I would roll up my sleeve if it were, I can probably try it, is my dog who is now gone as well. So oh, I love that. Yeah. So he was, he was a good boy. Um, Haley. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. Me. You've been so generous with your time. And I'm really excited. I hope I get to meet you in person uh, at TPC Harding Park next week. Oh, you will, because I talk to everyone. So if you don't <laughs> talk, I'll be hiding in the corner. <laughs> I will find you and we will chat. <laughs> uh, well, hey, thank you so much for having me on. And I look forward to meeting you next week. Likewise. Take care. <laughs> See you soon. Awesome. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Now we have the good fortune to bring on our next guest, another LGBTQ history maker in the world of professional golf. Tad, welcome to Inside Pride. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you had a tournament this week, did you not? Did, I did. Yes, did I did. How'd it go? Um, it was okay. I did, uh, I did pretty well. Um, I played solid, but I missed qualifying I think by one or two shots so um, unfortunately it didn't uh, it didn't go quite as well as I wanted but um, I'm pretty happy with my progress and um, I've struggled quite a bit for the past you know few years with my game and um, you know I feel like I'm finally moving in the right direction which is for me is is great and um, you know I'm trying to uh, take the positives from it as much as I can yeah, you know, you've been very open about, you know, struggling with anxiety while competing at this top tier. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you're coming out of it. You feel better about your game? I do. I do. And mentally, I feel a lot better as well. Um, and, and my game has been improving um, as of late. So, uh, yeah, I feel like I'm doing the right things. Um, just got to keep going. And, uh, yeah, I feel feel hopeful for my future. Excellent. Have you ever played TPC Harding Park before? I have not. I have not. No. I was just out there for a site visit the other day. I mean, it's not, I mean, you've probably set foot on 100 golf courses for every one that I have, but I mean, it's really stunning with the cypress trees. I don't know. It's, mm -hmm. if you can sneak away and get like a key, like nine holes in or something. Yeah, hopefully. Um, it's, I've, I mean, obviously I've seen a lot of tournaments there and, um, you know, I've seen a lot of the scenery and, and what it looks like on TV. Obviously, it probably doesn't do it any justice. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing it and um, should be should be fun. Yeah. You know, three years ago when you became the first male PGA player to come out, um, it seems like there has not yet been a second, although for all I know, it's possible that you've had private conversations with other golfers, and I'm certainly not going to ask you to name any names or violate any privacy, but, you know, I don't think there's been a second, but do you know of a second? I do not. I do not. Um, I mean, I've met a lot of LGBTQ golfers, amateurs, um, you know, some college players and stuff, uh, and I haven't met any, like, PGA Tour players. They haven't, um, you know, reached out to me or anything. Uh, I have heard some rumors from like LPGA players that mm -hmm. they know of uh, a few few pros, but um, I don't. Me personally, I don't know anyone uh, as of yet. Obviously, like st st statistically, um, <laughs> there's got to be at least there's got to be few a few out there, you know. <laughs> but um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Hopefully, um, do you, yeah. You know, do you have any more? you have any insight into why that would be because you like i'm following your logic you would think you know 
it gets more and more acceptable <laughs> in every domain of American society to be queer every year. And after three years, that's a long time for you to kind of be out there all, all on your own. Do you, I mean, golf is a very solitary sport in a lot of ways. Do you think that that mm -hmm. might be a factor that people like the privacy of the struggles when you're on the course might translate to the way people regard their own sexuality? It could be very, very speculative on my part, but you know, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, you, you know, it's, um, golf has never been uh, a very progressive sport, you know, in, in that sense. And um, it, it still, still isn't, you yeah. know, I mean, obviously like we are trying to do better and trying to make the game more inclusive for everybody, regardless of, you know, gender or sexual preference. Um, whatever it may be, uh, you know, it, it, I think we're moving in the right direction, mm -hmm. you know, and I think we're taking a lot of positive steps, but it's still not the most welcoming sport. Um, you know, you look at a lot of um, pro LGBTQ content on social media that's related to like the PGA Tour um, or Golf Digest, any, any golf, you know, specific, um, Instagram or social media, um, a lot of the comments are very negative still to this day. And obviously yeah. like there are the handful of, of very, very good positive uh, comments out there, but um, I would say more than half of the comments are, are negative. Just and, homophobic vitriol you mean, or more? Um, you know, it, it's been, uh, I don't know. It, it, to me, it's been um, pretty negative in the sense that um, why does, why do we need a pride? Um, right. You, you know, like it, it, like basically they're saying they don't care, but at the same time, if they didn't care, like, why are you even commenting at all? You know? So yeah. um, kind of more in that sense. And it's uh we have a lot of work to do put it that yeah. way you know and and um you know it, it's been it's been good for me P personally it's been extremely positive um but i am really lucky like i i hear a lot of horror stories about golfers coming out um and their experiences with that and it, it just breaks my heart because for me it's been positive and it's been you know quite special mm -hmm. in that sense but for a lot of people it, it isn't and um you know it, it makes me sad angry pissed off <laughs> you know because i i feel like we all should be able to enjoy the sport um that we love to play and regardless of who we are and and where we come from i mean well put and really good for you for putting up with that bullshit because you know that in the aggregate that can really grind you down and like you know, yeah. you know just to turn to your uh personal instagram for a minute you know you're not you don't you're not shy you post some <laughs> some saucy stuff like i'm gonna just i'm gonna, I'm gonna quote you i'm gonna look at this right now and there is this on july 18th i think you know exactly where i'm going with this there's a picture of you shirtless getting that vitamin D from the sun since I can't get it from someone's son. Oh shit, Pad. Like I and the comments were pretty supportive. I mean, again, these are people who go out of their way to follow you. So of course they're gonna skew to the side of being on team tag. Yes. Like, hey, yes. you're you know, I what I'm saying here is knowing that the world of uh, you know, social media as it pertains to golf can be a landmine yeah. or a minefield. You went ahead and you're, you know, you're living your best life anyway. So good for you, dude. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, um, <laughs> I can't believe you actually like brought that up. Um, <laughs> no, you posted it. Not me. No. I, I, I did. I did. I don't yeah. Mean and, but it was, a, you know, it's a good picture too. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, it, for me, I think I've gotten to the point where I just like, don't give a shit anymore <laughs> well, <that's good. laughs> you know come out on the other side yeah and and um uh it's it's kind of scary you know with social media like being that open but at the same time it's like it's social media like come on it, mm -hmm. you know we're there to 
have fun and enjoy and and to laugh and um you know for me like social media has been a great platform for me to help people and i want to be a role model obviously that may not be like the greatest thing for um uh uh a, a child to to see or read but um uh, you know, sooner or later, they'll figure it out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's in your window. Okay, it's still PG-13. Yeah. I, don't think... <laughs> I guess, I guess. You're, you're but, fine. You're fine. you know, like, for the most part, I just try to be authentic. And, yeah. um, you know, I think we all have this mask that we put on and portray this image to other people when, um, and I think when that happens, it can affect our culture and our society like negatively um, because people only see like the greatest and best things in our lives right so we portray this picture that's like perfect and in reality like none of our lives are perfect we all go through struggles and we have these really bad down times and I try not to hide that too much just because I know like how much harm that's done for me and my um in my life like I just want to be open and honest with everybody and you know really just spread like positive vibes um to to whoever to whoever I can and um yeah that's that's kind of my goal so <laughs> that's, that's, that's sure. listen I want to I want to pose a question to you to get your perspective kind of pulling out a little bit in the last okay. five years seven years professional sports have become if not necessarily, you know, politicized, but professional athletes have taken stands on issues in a way that they really haven't in almost 50 years, right? Since like the late 60s and early 70s, mm -hmm. it's really come roaring mm -hmm. back. And in terms of like apparel or the clothes that that athletes wear when they're on TV, you see a lot of support for causes like Black Lives Matter and other mm -hmm. kind of hot button issues. And I'm wondering like golf being, as we have said, very conservative and kind of hidebound and very traditional. Also, there's a very particular aesthetic to the clothes that people wear on the course. Do you see that changing? And kind of, do you see golfers potentially in the near term kind of becoming more public with causes they support? Or is golf going to stay golf? That's a good question. I, I don't, I haven't really thought about that too much. Um, I, I think I think golf will always be golf in the in the sense that all right we need to wear a collared shirt you know belt slacks now they're allowing shorts which is nice um you know in in, in some instances so uh in tournaments anyway but um yeah I think that will sort of always always be there for for a little while um but I do hope that people express and um show more support for the lgbtq community because um you know like you said they show support for other uh causes black lives matter etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i think like the lgbtq community should be um should be supportive supported and um represented you know by, by more more athletes and you, you see it a lot more mm -hmm. frequently um i know one company that did um i don't know if you know what these are but they're like yardage book covers okay um so we have these yardage books that show like the map of the course right. and um a lot of players use covers for those books so it doesn't get all like messed up mm -hmm. and they had like a pride themed one um for pride month i believe and a lot of the players were using that, like on the LPJ tour. So, um, you know, the LPJ tour is actually rainbow colored. Like it looks, it looks, yeah, yeah. rainbow colored like covers. You know, for, for the it. books, which Got is it. amazing. I was like, I need one, but um, but yeah, I think uh, you know, I think you'll see more stuff like that, which is yeah. cool. Um, and the LPJ tour has been pretty supportive of our community for the most part. The players have been more outspoken. Obviously, um, you see that a lot more. Uh, more so than the PJ Tour, and I hope that you know the PJ Tour will sooner rather than later um, catch on to that and uh, and support our community as well because um, it's important. You know, it, it regardless of 
of uh, who it is um, and their sexuality um, mm -hmm. showing support for our community uh, you know I think is is very um, very important cause that's good and you know you live in a fairly conservative area of Georgia right and you feel you, you're yeah you're comfy where you are you like Seattle I um <laughs> Back to <the> <laughs> it's uh so there the area that I live in a uh, young gay men around there it's it's not it's not great for yeah. for my cause um it's very difficult to make you know social interactions yeah. with you know lgbtq people there's a few um and there's a lot of straight allies around here good. Uh, i shouldn't i shouldn't say a lot um a, a, li a, a few in uh you know in our community around here but um you're seeing it more often like people that are um you know supporters of us that uh that are more outspoken, which is nice. Um, this area is very conservative. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for me, it's it's difficult. And I thought about moving away, but for golf, it's good. And with the whole pandemic thing, like it's not a good time to just pick up and leave. So, <laughs> and, and to, to kind of start over as of right now. So um, I'm just kind of trying to wait it out. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's okay. It's not, it's not uh, the greatest thing for for my social life, um, but so far I just kind of do my own thing, and it's been all right. You know, it, it's been okay. So <laughs> well, when you eventually meet all the pride people next week here in San Francisco. Uh, we'll we'll take you out. We'll show you a good time. That sounds good to me. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to that. I just love being surrounded by people that are you know standing for the same cause and. Um, you know, people that are like me as well. So uh, it's been it's been a good journey so far, and I've met so many amazing people in our community, and I'm looking forward to uh, meeting more and making more connections. Yeah, nice. And obviously, you know, like you said earlier, your golf game is back in action. You're killing it out there. So hey, you we wish you the best, and we will see you. Soon. Thank you. Yeah, right. yeah. sounds Thank good. You very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This has been Inside Pride, a production of San Francisco Pride. Without the generous support of our sponsors, none of this would be possible. So a big thank you to T-Mobile, Alaska Airlines, Anheuser-Busch, and Waymo. I'm your sickening host, Peter Astrid Kane, reminding you to be safe, but stay dangerous. We'll see you next time.